So LA Skid Row. It's only a couple of miles from here, a few blocks in radius, but it has the highest concentration of homelessness in the entire country. I never expected to spend the vast majority of my first two years of medical school living on Skid Row. The entirety of the experience, to first stumbling on there, to going back night after night, the entirety of it was completely accidental. I mean, I'm just a dude, and I pretty much have two big passions that inspire almost everything I do, and that's medicine and wilderness. You know, and the fact that these two things came together to bring me to Skid Row and bought me back time and time again, I mean, it still boggles my mind. I mean, let's take it, medicine. You know, I wanted to be a doctor since high school. I remember being out in the high mountains and I was slammed with high altitude pulmonary edema. And I was in a tent, couldn't breathe, dying, you know, and all of a sudden a chopper came and, what we would call a chopper, chopper came and picked me up and took me to hospital, and doctors gave me a second shot at life. And I remember, man, he'd go to school for a few years and learn how to give someone a second chance at life. Sign me up, that sounds awesome. And then, so I got into med school, and I mean, I wanted some time off before I hit the books. So I was like, connect with the other passion, the wilderness. And I thought it would be sweet to hike the Pacific Crest Trail. You know, I mean, it's this pristine, stretch of wilderness that goes from Mexico to Canada through the deserts and mountains of California, Oregon, and Washington. And I mean, I figured hike this trail for five months, end up super stoked, get break life down to its absolute simplicity. You know, food, water, shelter, health. And that was my goal. And I was pretty stoked until about mile 700 of the hot desert <laughs> where I mean, I was hot. I was tired of hiking 30 miles a day and carrying water and eating cliff bars. And I mean, all of a sudden, you know, I just graduated from college and the college sweethearts started like, started, you know, hearing. And what did that do except put me on the side of a road with my thumb out. And I was like, okay, has grander plan. Stick my thumb out, get to Elliot. She was going to land. I was going to intercept the plane. I was going to get her attention. She's going to sweep her off her feet and whoo. Now, here's what like, I didn't think about was the fact that, I mean, I hadn't showered in two months. Um, I had a monstrosity of a beard. My shirt was like smelly and bloody and like torn. And the way I tried to get her attention was the way a good friend taught me to get things at people's attention in the mountains. You bird call. Waka! Waka! So the only attention that I got from anybody was of Homeland Security. <laughs> no, it sucked, I'm telling you. So they took me and they handcuffed me and they tied me to a chair, handcuffed me to a chair. They stripped me naked, body cavity searched me, put tied me up to a lie detector machine, making sure I was telling the truth about not being a terrorist. I mean, it was, I have never, I mean, that was, they take the ultimate stoke and take the lowest of a low and that was the lowest of a low. And, I mean, what they do to potential terrorists, I mean, you know, my name, Ali, probably didn't help the situation. <laughs> um, but bottom line, I mean, eventually they let me go. But, I mean, I was just, like, I was disheveled. I was just, like, distraught. Like, what just happened to me? They put me on a flyaway bus, you know, when they finally let me go. Like, hurrah, congratulations, you're not a terrorist, get out of here. Flyaway bus to Union Station. I was trying to go from Union Station to USC, you know few mile walk and it was during that walk that I ended up on Skid Row for the first time and I was walking around going through it was like must be past midnight and all of a sudden I felt like I was in a different kind of wilderness you know I mean it was like it was like Camp 4 of Yosemite I mean tents were everywhere right um, there was little fires going everywhere I mean instead of instead of the usual rolled joints there were people were smoking crack and shooting heroin it's different um, Instead of, instead of like the big masses of granite, there were just concrete buildings. But what really got me was there was like a mountain brotherhood of spirit. Like I mean, I sat down on the curb, just like distraught after the worst day of my life. And some guy came next to me, looked at me, and was like, dude, you look like crap. <laughs> and he, then he disappeared, and then he came back and bought me a drink, 40, naturally. And it was just like... I've just, 
you know, LAX is supposed to be like what welcomes you to LA, right? And no. What welcomed me back to LA was this guy get buying me a drink on Skid Row and saying, like, man, tell me about your day. It looked like crap. And I ended up talking to him, spending hours with him, learning his story, learning about Skid Row, and I was hooked. Even when I went back and finished the hike to, to uh, Canada, he was on my mind. And when I started med school, that first week of med school sucked, and I was trying to figure out a way to get re-inspired, and I went back to Skid Row to talk to this guy again. And I couldn't find him. But in the search of trying to find him, trying to see who else is there, I got more and more inspired. I met more and more people with more and more crazy stories. So it got to the point where I got this rhythm down. You know, I'd go to class and I'd like pack up my sleeping bag and a tarp and roll it all in and like walk down to Skid Row. And like my goal was to get into someone's tent because I figured all my best friends I've shared a tent with in the mountains. So it'd be the same thing. You share a tent with someone in Skid Row, you're going to be like mountain brothers, right? <laughs> um, to LAPD's fury, I started hosting campfires. There's this like fresh pinion pine that grows in the desert and I mean like, oh, you, you burn it in the desert and it smells delicious and you burn it on Skid Row and it smells even better and I found that it started the greatest conversations. And I mean, some of these conversations made me stoked. I'm talking about like, I hear guys and gals working through the 12 steps and I feel like I was like pumping them on and encouraging them. I felt like I was actually doing something. They were overcoming drug addiction. I was awesome. There was a guy who broke down Einstein's theory of relativity to me like I've never heard it before, and I actually understood it. <laughs> and, I mean, this guy was one who lost all of his stuff because he had visual hallucinations, but he was a genius, a photographic memory. But, you know, every time I was stoked on Skid Row, there were times where I was absolutely petrified, terrified. I mean, there's nothing scarier than sharing a tent with a paranoid schizophrenic who puts a loaded gun in your hand and tells you to shoot him in the middle of the night. I mean, that, I, I mean, I still get nightmares from that. I still get nightmares from the several times I was beaten to a pulp. There's times on Skid Row where I like woke up in the middle of the night and was so scared, I just ran. I just put, took all my stuff and just ran to my car, put it in four-wheel drive, escaped to the mountains or with friends with an open arm. You know, and that was the weird thing was that I had an escape where these guys don't. And that's what really made me guilty. You know, so I'm mean, like, what can I say, I mean, about this place that, like, inspires me so much, but also terrifies me? Like, what can I say about this place that, I don't know, I feel, like, I mean, I can't even tell my own mom about this place, you know? Like, my mom thinks I'm a good Indian medical student hitting the books hard where I've been living on Skid Row for two years. She has no idea. She's going to find this out on YouTube. <laughs> I mean... I don't, I don't know what I, I want all of you to know and understand Skid Row, but it's a place I don't want anyone to experience. So I thought I'd end with a story, a poem, I mean, call it what you will. It's the last few hours of a night, one of the worst nights I've had on Skid Row. And it's the night that I lost a friend named Zane to the row. Here I am, lying in my quote-unquote bed, stuck in my head, trying to forget what I saw tonight what I heard tonight, what I felt tonight. Trying to sleep, trying to quiet that internal roar inside of me that makes me weep for the soul that left this earth tonight. His name was Zane. Wide-eyed, I lie. I feel all the cracks on the sidewalk, feel apathetic to the cockroaches crawling all over me, for they're nothing compared to the guilt that has swallowed me, suffocating me on this God-forsaken tent city. I hear two men next to me, one cries, the other laughs hysterically, pontificating on why Zane's life did not matter, why his time on this earth was irrelevant, and I lie here, listening, grasping, letting this homeless man's servant on the futility of life sink, and before I too start thinking, damn, maybe my life doesn't matter either. Maybe my life doesn't matter either. Then horrified, petrified, I pull out the cardboard from underneath me and start writing furiously, thinking that if I write fast enough, some things, some words will come out of that piece of paper that will just, I don't know, bring Zane back, that'll allow me to process the fact that Zane died in my arms, that my 30, 40 minutes of compressions, hard and fast, hard and fast, weren't good enough, that what he needed wasn't a student but a doctor, that this place, Skid Row, should not exist. But none of that happened. I wrote on that piece of paper, it didn't bring Zane back. 
It didn't cure the schizophrenia or the rampant tuberculosis. It didn't put roofs over people's heads. Everyone was still doing crack, cocaine, and heroin. But what it did do was it made me stop crying. It calmed my heart enough to make that morning walk to the Keck School of Medicine to sit in class and try to learn. And at the end of lecture, when I saw all my classmates walking past me, the thought of Zane hit me again, and an answer came. Maybe all I could do was tell people Zane's story. Maybe all I could do was tell people about Skid Row, tell people that Skid Row exists, that this place exists, and most importantly, it doesn't have to. Thank you. When's the last time you were back? Actually, two days ago. Yeah. I went uh, with a bunch of medical students to yeah. feed homeless in the homeless shelter. So do you go back? Does it feel the same now as it did before? Um, no, that's kind of the weird thing. I mean, you thought, I mean, all these times I have friends that, you know, I would think that, oh, I could recognize people and stuff. But I mean, the most heartbreaking thing is sharing a tent with somebody and then realizing the next day or something that they absolutely have no idea who you are. Wow. You know, ideally, the, the good thing is that I don't like some people I know because then you can go out and either they moved on, you know, they got yeah. out, they got housing, and they moved on to some other place and are getting their, getting their things together, which is awesome to see. Well, good luck with that. I know you're, you're trying to bring more of the um, Keck, Keck School, the students out there a bit, so it's yeah. really important work. So thank you so much for sharing thank your you. story. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.